If you don't have a sermon outline, you will need one this morning. If you're new to us this morning, we do use a sermon outline so that everybody can stay in tune with where we are. If you have your Bible, take it and turn with me to Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, and uh, you'll want to look and see um, this beautiful, beautiful little letter. It's a very short letter, but it's a very powerful letter. We have been talking about church leadership, and some would be tempted to think, wow, why are we looking at church leadership so much? Um, Can't we just kind of breeze through this? We're not all pastors and it would be a lot easier to get on to the other stuff, let the pastors deal with the pastor stuff, and let the church deal with the, the church members deal with the other stuff. It has been that attitude that has caused, for the last 250 or 300 years of the church in the West, to falter. When we do not recognize the tremendous truth of God's word in every area that has to do with our ecclesiology or our church life, the ecclesiastical aspect of our being together, we can get into great trouble. Suddenly, just because a guy is bright, he becomes a pastor. Or suddenly, just because a guy is dumb and he can't do anything else, he becomes a pastor. Um, Suddenly, because a guy is good looking or because a guy Um, isn't strong or because he is, whatever it is, through the last few hundred years, in different cultures, different societies, um, we've not been careful to pay attention to what God says about who should be leading in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. From Europe to Asia to Africa to America, we have neglected this truth, we have neglected this standard, and we are now paying for it. And so this morning, I come before you humbly asking for us as a church family to look carefully at what God's Word says about who should be a pastor and who should not be a pastor. As we pay attention to this teaching, the church will become more healthy. And as the church becomes more healthy, your individual Christian life can be all that God has made for it, designed for it to be. God wants you, I believe, to walk with him in truth and in freedom, to worship him in spirit and in truth, and to make it Monday through Saturday as well as Sunday as a Christian. And so we come to his word again this morning and ask the Lord to speak to us, and uh, we have prayed for that. Jim, thank you for your prayer that God would prepare our hearts, and I have prayed for that uh, this morning for each one of us. Um, I want to review with you where we've been, and this is a change in the review, so uh, don't think it's been like the previous weeks. It's a little bit different. And notice, first of all, the title of the message, To Be or Not to Be, um, a Pastoral Qualifications. And I call it that because in verses 7 and 8, we see this, what it's not to be and what it is to be, um, both. Um, and so this morning we will be focusing a little bit on the to be, more so on the not to be, the things that are prohibited, and then next Sunday we'll be looking at the to be once again. But notice here with the review, if you're new to us this morning, this will help you a lot to get something out of the message because you'll understand the context. Number one, the Apostle Paul writes to Titus about how to lead the circle at wayward, the wayward churches of Crete to establish three things, right doctrine, right leaders, and right living. They had a problem with their doctrine, and the reason they had a problem with their doctrine is because they had the wrong leaders. That's what happens when you have bad leaders. Doctrine goes by the wayside. Um, And so they had a problem with what they believed, they had a problem with who was leading them, and their behavior as a church was not honoring to Christ. And so the churches um, all over the island had trouble, and Titus was left behind by the Apostle Paul to straighten out the mess. Look at number two. Paul instructs, you know what? I put the wrong word there. Cross out Timothy and put Titus. So um, I just noticed it as I saw that. So uh, Paul instructs Titus. He also instructs Timothy as a young pastor, but he instructs Titus to appoint godly elders or pastors or overseers. Those are all used synonymously in numerous places in the New Testament. He he appoints them 
to, or he calls him to appoint godly pastors, not just anyone who will do it, not just anyone who everybody thinks is great, but the ones who meet the qualifications that would be correct. Number, notice number three. Worldly leaders, and by that I mean leaders that are worldly, that are, that are fleshly, worldly leaders wreck the church. That's what worldly leaders do. They wreck the church. Biblical leaders build the church. So if, if we're looking at what kind of leader the world offers, and we apply the leadership principles of the world, and we apply all of the conventional thinking of the world to God's church, to God's people, we get a bunch of the world. And let me tell you, folks, the world is wrecked. I don't know if you've figured that out yet. It's broken, and it can't fix itself. There's attempts here and there. Little things get better, and then a lot of things get worse. We have major, major issues that we will never dig ourselves out of until the Lord Jesus sets everything right. And so we recognize that world leaders wreck the church, but biblical leaders will build the church. We looked as part of these, um, these uh, qualifications. The first one was, the first overarching idea, number four is, above reproach. A leader is to be above reproach. This is an overarching description, not of sinless perfection, but godly reputation. This doesn't mean that you have to have a perfect pastor. There are no perfect pastors. In fact, there are no perfect churches. If you find a perfect church, do what? Please don't join it. Why? You'll kill it. You will make it imperfect. The church is full of imperfect people. And the church is pastored by imperfect pastors. We're not talking about sinless perfection. But what we are talking about, and what's very important in both Timothy and in Titus and in Peter, we see that those who are to lead the people of God are not to have a reputation that's a bad reputation, a bad moral reputation, but a reputation that when people think of them, they think of godliness. They think of somehow that which is honorable as opposed to that which is dishonorable. Now, I'm sorry that many of you, you know, the closer you are to me, the more that's a stretch for you. Um, Marcy can tell you all the things in my life um, that are not sinless perfection. Um, she can tell you about all that very quickly. The other pastors can, tend to, we could talk about each pastor and just shred one another if we wanted to. But the big picture is this is that we are called to be people who seek to live, truly live by God's word and seek to live within the confounds of what he has said on our morality and on our heart worship. Look at number five. The first one mentioned about above reproach is number five, and it says, husband of one wife. We looked at that at length, and it's, it means that his moral life reflects God's design of sacrificial, faithful love. Husband of one wife means more than simply that he is a guy that doesn't have a bad moral reputation and that he hasn't messed up. The picture is here that he loves God's design that God has given in marriage. Now, we said, why is that so important to God? Why would husband of one wife, why would his wife be so important to the pastorship in the life of the church? It's because marriage is God's huge object lesson about what he wants with each one of us. Your marriage is important to God. God is on the side of your marriage. God wants your marriage to be strong. God wants your marriage to be a good representation of his kind of love, a sacrificial, committed, self-sacrificing love that is truly, truly faithful. And so it is a big deal that those who lead the church understand that. Notice the next one here, number six. At the very least, the behavior of a pastor's children can disqualify him from ministry. At the very least, 
the behavior of God's children can disqualify him from ministry. Um, a lot could be said about that. I thought that I listened to Pastor um, Ben's message while we were in California last week, and I thought he did an excellent job of dealing with a very difficult text. Um, a difficult text on several fronts. Number one, because of the situation of pastors in the present mentality among so many churches, but also because this issue of of fatherhood in the life of the church is critically important, not just for pastors, but for every single one of us that are families, every single one of us that are fathers and grandfathers, um, that, are, that are fathers within children in the life of the church and even as a surrogate father in the life of the church to others who may not be biologically yours, but are yours in the body of Christ. And so this is very important. Um, a lot could be said about that, and we'll deal with it at different times, but let me just share this with you on number six. When I was in high school, I went through a time when I was not walking closely with the Lord. And my dad, who was a pastor in this church, my dad was an electrical engineer, or an industrial engineer from Georgia Tech, and he had moved here, started a company, and as soon as he got his company going, Pastor Billingsley asked him to sell his company and to become the administrator or the church um, executive pastor. And my dad became that. So I grew up in a pastor's home. Dad would teach, he would preach, but he mainly did administration. Um, everybody in this growing large church um, knew me, knew my brother, knew my sister. And Mark, and Mark and Kelly seemed to get along a little bit easier with all of that than I did, but there was a time there when I was 15, 16, 17 years old where I was struggling um, to figure out what I believed and figure out how I was going to live. And there were some times there when Dad knew that, and as I would be going out, Dad would sometimes stop me at the door, and he would say, son, as you go out tonight, I want you to know that my ministry is in your hands. My ministry is at your mercy tonight. And, you know, some people, modern psychologists would say, how horrible to tell a young man. How horrible to put that kind of pressure on a young man. Let me tell you that that pressure kept me from doing things that would have wrecked my life. And it wasn't merely because he was a pastor. But it was also all that he had taught and all that he had sought to guide was on my mind and on my heart as I would go out and as I would live my life and discover where I was called to be. And so um, I just want to say to you that uh, my dad understood that well. My dad understood that if I would be accused of insubordination and debauchery, that he would no longer have a voice in the life of the church and that he would no longer have a ministry in the life of the church. And so this, this morning as we come to this passage and as we look at this and as we say, I want you to know that it's very real to me as having grown up in the life of the church, having grown up even as a preacher's kid. How many of you have ever heard, well, you know, the pastor's daughter, you know about those preacher daughters, don't you? I mean, sometimes they would, quote unquote, have um, the worst reputation in town or the, he's a pastor's kid, you know, very rebellious. And part, let me just remind you that a lot of that comes through and out of cultural Christianity. And we have to be careful as we look at that, to be careful to do and to look at the Scripture and to be careful to, to and understand exactly what it's saying. Now, I'm also, I want you to know that this morning as well as last night, I was especially praying for all of these, all of those in the life of the church this morning, that God is calling them to be a pastor or he's calling them to be a pastor's wife. I believe that there's people here um, that are very young. I believe that there's people here that are in their 20s. I believe there's some here that are 30s, perhaps even 40s, that God is calling them to become a pastor. And I want you to know that as a church family, we are all about this, understanding that what we recognize in the Word of God will determine the health and the direction not only of this church, but perhaps many churches in the years to come because of the influence 
that we have with one another. And so one of the things I want us to do is just go back and look at the passage on the box, and we're going to quickly move through it um, before we come to the Lord's table. Look at verse 5 with me. First, or Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. It says, this is why I left you in Crete. Who's writing this? Okay. Who's writing this? The apostle Paul. Very good. And he's writing it to who? Titus. Not Timothy, but to Titus. Look what he says in verse 5. This is why I, Paul, left you in Crete, Titus, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Verse 6 is the first time we see the above reproach. We've already studied this. Verse 6, if anyone is above reproach, then here it is, the husband of one wife, his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Verse 7, where we are today. For an overseer as God's steward, here it is again, must be what? Must be above reproach. It's actually stated slightly different, and we're going to see that. He must not be what? Arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Verse 8 are the things that he must be. But hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. The first thing I want us to recognize here is, and you can fill this in, a pastor is an accountable manager. He's not an account manager, as in this is his account, the church, but he is an accountable manager. He will give an account for this, and he's an accountable manager of God's household. In fact, the word that is used here is steward. I want you to see this in the middle of verse 7, or in the, right there in the middle of verse 7. Look at the screen. It says, for an overseer as God's what? Steward. Circle that word steward up there in the box on your page. The steward, and it must be, what, what is a steward? I, we, we don't really know what a steward is these days. In fact, if you're like many folks who, when you hear the word steward, you have an image like this, perhaps, in your mind of a guy who's there ready to serve. Um, we may use the word stewardess, um, and we immediately think of a flight attendant, right? Okay, she's a flight attendant, he's a, he's a steward or a stewardess on board a flight attendant. That's one of the ways that we use it. Most of the time we use flight attendant now. Some of you have been on a cruise before, and uh, as you're going on board the cruise, from what I understand, very often the captain or some of the higher up or officers are there, and the, he- the chief steward will be there. And here he is with all of his regalia and his uniform, and he is welcoming you on board the ship. And then he has other stewards that are underneath him, and these stewards come and take care of you while they're there. They're just kind of a servant that is there. We often think of them as a waiter or a server. But that is, an, that is not a proper understanding of the biblical word steward. A biblical word steward is a very big word. It's a big word that was big in their society. And I want you to see this. It's made up of two Greek words linked together. It's made up of oikos and nomos. And oikos means house. Nomos is the word for law or order. It could be command, not just We often think of law and order. That means, well, everything's orderly. Well, no, it has to do with orders. It has to do with commandments. It has to do with the law that is here. And so what we start to see in this passage is that a steward is one who is in charge of a wealthy person's estate. This is someone who would be known in their society. And when he would be moving about town or something like that, if the estate was rather large, if the person that he represented was rather large, everybody would kind of know who this guy was. Oh, that's the steward for Mr. So-and-so. And And he was in charge of the house, and he was in charge of the land that was there. So fill it in, these bullet points that are here, he was a, this was a known and significant position in a wealthy person's house and land. Fill it in, this was a man who was a freed man and not a slave. 
Now, there may have been slaves in the house. There may have been other groups in the house. In Roman society or in Greek society, the Romans were very powerful. They had gone in and they had taken slaves from all over the world. Slavery was a huge issue in the Roman Empire, as wrong and as horrible and as wicked as that is. In so many ways, we, we look at that and we say, that's, that's not a very... Um, good and righteous thing. We've seen that in our own country and all the horror of that. But we, we notice here that the concept of slavery, we, we see it throughout the scripture, and we see that it's very important for Christians to understand this and that God even works through all of this and God uses all of this. And one of the ways in we see it is even in this idea that this man is a servant in the life of the church, um, excuse me, a servant in this man's house, um, but he would typically not be a, a slave. He would be a man who is free. Notice the next one there. He's a trusted man. You wouldn't put just anyone in charge of your house while you're away, that your wife and your children are there and the other servants are there. This is a trusted man in his decisions. In, in fact, many times he would have, to, he would have uh, uh, a lot of authority over the crops that were being grown or the, the business that was associated around the house um, that was there. This would be a man who was a responsible man and who knows well that he, fill this in, he knows well that he will answer for his management. Now you need to understand the word steward if you're going to understand who a pastor is. Because the Bible tells us right here in Titus chapter 1 and verse 7 that an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. And I want you to see these, these concepts that we've looked at. First of all, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that is the other place where all the qualifications of a pastor are given. And toward the end of that chapter, we see these verses that I've laid out here. Um, and I want you to notice this and fill this in. 1 Timothy that chapter 3 is all about pastoral qualifications in what is called God's household. So that idea of steward, now we see it showing up. This is God's house. It's not just a wealthy man's house. This is God's house. This is God's group of people. This is God's home. This is God's affairs. So the pastor is like that steward that's in charge of a wealthy man's home, but instead it's not just any mere man's home. It is God's family and God's work. Look at verse 14. I hope to come to you soon, but this is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in what? The household of God. Circle that. That's talking about pastors. He's talking about how pastors ought to be which is the church of the living God. The household of God is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. That means a, a massive support, a fortification of the truth. And so the church is proclaiming the truth. The church is representing God to the world. It is a buttress of the truth. It is, it is that which supports God's truth. God uses us as his people to show the world who he is. And the pastors of the church are seen as stewards in God's house. Now, verse 13, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, reve 17, reveals pastors are going to answer to God for their actions. And I can tell you that this concept right here, not only early on, but even still, sometimes makes me wonder, do I really want to do this? And I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not being dramatic. There is a very real judgment that is coming. Our life is going to be laid out before the Lord. And it is true that those who take on spiritual responsibility before God will be held accountable for what they did and what they said and who they were. And... We don't need pastors who are not very seriously concerned about that point. We need pastors 
who realize that they're going to give an account. You see, if you got a guy that just says, man, I can do this. People like me. People follow me. You know, I've got good ideas and everything else. I think I can do this. And it's, it's not about, you know, it's a, it's a job that has a little bit of esteem and, you know, da 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 I think, I think I'd like to do this. I, you know, and if you're just thinking in an earthly way, guys, you could well be on a road that's going to lead to a great judgment. I want to say to you, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 is a sobering picture for both the pew and the pulpit. And notice how it is for both the pew and the pulpit. Look at verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Well, that's pretty serious. The Bible tells you to obey your leaders. Don't just do whatever you want. Don't just run in your life. And when you start doing the wrong thing and the leader comes to you and says, hey, I think we have a problem. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls, underline it, as those who will give, who, excuse me, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would have no advantage for you. There's a lot of people in cultural Christianity that need to look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. You know, there's people who just think it's their God-ordained position in the church uh, to give the pastor a hard time. I praise the Lord that that's not at Sheridan Hills, and I really mean that. But in the past, maybe you've been a part of a church where there was somebody who just thought it was his job to, you know, stir things up. Well, let me tell you that the Bible does not esteem that role. Um, in fact, the Bible warns very seriously against that. In fact, Titus warns very seriously about that in Titus chapter 3 and verse 10. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning. There are some people who are factious people. They just want to create trouble. They just want to create division. They want to create trouble that, that leads to strife in the life of the church. Well, that's part of the reason you have a pastor is to help protect the church from that. And here we see that it is not good for you, it's not good for your own life if you simply push back all the time. But the main thing I want to point out here is that one of the reasons that you ought to listen to pastors is that they're going to give an account for what they tell you. And they're going to give an account for the way that they lead. And hopefully that brings a great gravitas to what they are doing. Look at the last one that is here. In um, don't flip the sheet over. Just look at the last page here. I want you to see this. I want you to see this passage. This is really good. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. This, this is just packed. These three verses are packed with beautiful instruction concerning pastors. Um, look what it says. It reveals that the pastor is to be led, excuse me, the pastor is to lead with a glad and gentle heart. That should be the attitude of a pastor. A pastor is not the master pastor. A pastor is not the dictator, the potentate in the life of the church. He, he is not the one who has totalitarian rule in the life of the church. No, notice this and recognize this, that maybe, maybe you've experienced that before. Different, different cultures and different time periods um, in the world and in, uh, even in American society had, has different experiences with this, and I want you to see what is to be the heart of a pastor. Look what it says in verse 1. It says, so I exhort the elders, circle the word elders, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. It, it, it doesn't say rule over the, the flock of God. It doesn't say order them, or it, it doesn't say that you're to manipulate them. It, look what it says, shepherd them. What does a shepherd do? He takes care of the sheep. He leads the sheep. He feeds the sheep. He, he leads them to still waters. He leads them to green pastures. He takes care of them very much like we see in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. So verse 2, circle the word shepherd. So you've circled elders, circle the word shepherd. It's an important point. Shepherd the flock that is among you 
exercising oversight, and notice this, not under compulsion, but willingly. And here's what I want you to see. You see, this is not a slave. A pastor is not a slave in that he, he's just, he's only doing this because he's compelled to do it. Instead, it says, do this willingly. Look at the middle part of that. But willingly, as God would have you, not from shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but underline it, but being what? Examples to the flock. Um, have you ever heard the phrase, a whole lot more is caught than taught? That's very, very true. And that's true not only in your home and in the classroom, but that's true in the life of the church. So flip your page and look at this with me. Titus 1, verse 7 and 8 gives us this picture. And again, we see this idea that this steward, this important position that we see from Roman society that is, that is used as a, as a descriptor of what a pastor is to be in the church, again, we see that the above reproach statement comes up. I want you to see this. Now, we see in verse 7, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be, underline that, must be. In verse 6, it simply said is. But here we see the imperative. This is an imperative. He must be above reproach. Now, when the Bible says something once, it's important. When it says it twice, there's, a, there's an added emphasis that is worth your looking at. We're humans. We're humans of language and of teaching concept. And when the Bible repeats things, it is very important, especially when it repeats things in close order. And here we see, within a matter of just a few words, two verses, in fact, that a pastor is one who is above reproach, goes a husband of one wife, children are not accused of these things, da 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 And then we come to verse 7, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. There's the imperative. You see, fill this in. A pastor leads by what he does, namely teaching. That's one of the main roles of pastors, teaching. Um, but it could also be caring and some other things and leading, but namely by teaching. He leads by what he does. But a pastor also leads, fill this in, and this is so important for us, by who he is, by his example. And I have to say to you that even as I preach this, this is so convicting to me. It is hard for me to preach this because I know I'm not a perfect example. Now, that's not some cloaked, you know, whatever. I, I, I'm just saying, who is perfect except the Lord? But nevertheless, when we read these things, there's enough descriptions here that we know what's acceptable and we know what's not acceptable. And that's the point of this passage, is that God is calling us to recognize who should and who should not be uh, appointed as pastors or be leading as pastors. So a pastor leads by what he does, but he also leads by who he is by his example. And we saw that just on the other side in 1 Peter chapter 5. So, let's also recognize this truth. So does a mother, a father, a teacher, a boss, a witness for Christ. This concept goes to your home. This concept goes into motherhood. This concept goes into fatherhood. This concept is throughout the business world. This concept is everywhere. That you can, you can order people around, but if you really want to see what real leadership is about, Real leadership leads by example. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay, so as we see this, verse 7, for an overseer, as up there at the box on the top of the page, for an overseer as God's steward, there's that word, steward, must be above reproach. And here are the not-to-be's. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. And you see on the screen that there's five of them underlined. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain. I want to take just a couple of minutes and look at these. The first one is, he's not to be arrogant. This means he is not to be self-willed and prideful. 
This means that he is not to think of himself as better than everyone else, and he's not to think of himself as the potentate that doesn't have to listen to anyone else. You see, that is very unwise leadership. Oh, it's true that by force there are certain business people and there are certain um, uh, mothers or fathers or community leaders who by the sheer force of their personality can get things done. But that is not supposed to be the driving factor in the life of the church. He's not supposed to be just because he can force. It's not supposed to be that he does. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 42 through 44. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. You could, you could think of Roman rulers or you could think of business leaders in the Roman Empire. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It's all about power. It's all about this ability to control. Look at verse 43. Look what Jesus says and underline this. But it shall not be so among you. It's not by force that you are governed or that by you are led. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Verse 44, and whoever would be first among you, look what it says must be slave of all. You see, God's leadership and the way God works is very different, in fact, very often opposite of the way the world works. I mean, when we read at the beginning of this service, Philippians chapter 2, we recognize that the high king of heaven, the king over all things, comes and leaves the halls of heaven and becomes a slave that winds up going to his death on the cross in order to show his love and rescue his people. And so this is the beautiful picture of the gospel, and that is to be the picture even in the life of the church. But it shall not be so among you. It's not to be arrogant and self-willed and prideful. Look at the next one that is here, number two. And we see this right there in the text. He, is not, he must not be arrogant. He must not be quick-tempered. This means impatient. This means impulsive. And that impulsiveness in this idea of quick-tempered would mean it's easily angered, that he's easily angered. It, it, it's not that he doesn't ever get angry. It's just that he shouldn't be easily angered. Um, and there's a, there's a difference in this. Quick-tempered is the thing. This would mean he is intemperate. He is not able to be tempered. Um, this is a serious issue, and this is alive and well in the life of the church today. Um, 25 years ago, when Marcy and I, well, 22 years ago, when Marcy and I were graduating from seminary, coming up on graduation, Marcy was pregnant. I needed to figure out where we were going to be. I mean, we were about to have a baby. I was about to graduate. Marcy and I were graduating together from Southwestern Seminary, and we were, we were just interviewing with all of these churches that were coming to the seminary to interview the grads that were about to be out into the church life and uh, around the nation. And so I was kind of open to doing a lot of different things. I was interviewing for this kind of position, this kind of position that was only 25 years old. And what does he know? But um, one, of the, one of the positions was for a large church in Mississippi as their minister of evangelism. And um, I remember interviewing with them just a little bit right on campus, and we talked, we had a nice conversation, and I was kind of interested in them and didn't really want to go to Mississippi, but I love Mississippi for those of you who are from Mississippi, but I didn't want to live there um, necessarily. But, you know, we talked to them a little bit, and then God began to, a few weeks go by, and um, I talked to the pastor a couple times, and I was careful not to lead on uh, too much, but there was a lot of other discussions. And I remember when we realized that God was calling us to go to St. Augustine and to plant a church, I remember that I had to make some phone calls um, or respond to some folks um, that I had been speaking to. And this pastor in, in Mississippi um, called me, and we talked for a few minutes, and when I told him that, no, I'm going to be going to Florida and planting a church, he immediately became enraged. 
and he started yelling at me on the phone. And that went on for a few seconds, and we talked for a little bit, and I just said, well, I'm really sorry. I, you know, I just feel like God has led me toward this. We hadn't made any, any discussion or promises about anything, and he was wanting us to fly down there and everything. And I hung up the phone that day thinking, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for delivering me from that. because it would have been miserable. That man came to Florida. He pastored here in Florida for a few years. He is out of the ministry today, having been scandalized. Scandalized on two points. Number one is anger, and number two, one that we're about to get to. And you know what? He's not the only one. I mean, some of you are sitting there going, I know exactly what you're talking about grew up with it, or saw it, or whatever. Again, there's no perfect pastors, no perfect churches, but here are pretty good indicators of things that we are to pay attention to. Number three, he must not be a what? A drunkard. This literally means addicted or given to wine. Um, now, I have laid out some things here that I hope that you will really pay attention to and recognize that... Um, if you go back in the Old Testament, and you, it's not just in the New Testament, you go back through the Old Testament, and you look at Aaron and Moses, and Aaron and his priests, the priests that were there, Leviticus 10 says that they were not to be involved with wine. Look at the next one, the Nazarite vow. This is found in, New, in Numbers chapter 6, 1 through 21. Samson, Samuel, even John the Baptist, these were Nazarites. And the vow that they took was an issue of consecration to God. And it's interesting that among the other things that were ruled out in the Nazarite vow was alcohol. Alcohol was one of the things that, if you're going to be consecrated to God, you, if you're going to be in leadership, alcohol is a bad idea. Look at the next one. Remember the warnings for political leaders in general. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 4 through 5, talks about how kings better be careful when it comes to alcohol because they can make commitments and then forget about those commitments when they're under the influence of alcohol and hurt the people. And so the issue of alcohol and political leaders. Look at the next one. Remember the warnings about causing others to stumble. 1 Corinthians and Romans chapter 14 both deal with this idea, and it becomes a very crucial issue within the life of the church because there are some people here that, man, they get around alcohol and their life is destroyed. 7% of the population of the United States of America deals with alcohol addiction, 7%. That is massive. I mean, you run the numbers on th over 300 million people, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of people that deal with this. And so not only as Christians should we be careful within the life of our church, but also, especially, I think about pastors, because, you know, people look at the pastor, and whatever the pastor's doing, you know, they're, they're going to have even a little bit more leeway in their mindset in that. Leadership must be very careful. And so Paul says to Titus, this guy cannot have an alcohol problem. Um, that is, that is, brings great devastation on the church. Now, notice this. It's interesting that um, some people have often said, well, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, um, even, you know, Tim the idea that Paul tells Timothy, take a little bit of wine for your stomach. Now, here's the thing to recognize. Remember that even Timothy, as a result of that verse, we see that Timothy would not drink alcohol. Timothy had made the decision as a leader in the church, I'm not going to drink alcohol. And the apostle Paul had to say, hey, dude, because of your stomach problems, because we have bacteria in the water here in the nice Roman municipal water systems um, all over the place in the ancient world, a little, bit of, a little bit of wine added to the water could make it so that your stomach is able to survive this. Apparently, Timothy had a weak stomach. Timothy had a lot of things that were struggles. I mean, he was often afraid. He was often um, just kind of, it appeared not to be very strong, had to be told to be strong. And even physically, his constitution, it appears, needed encouragement where Apostle, the Apostle Paul said, hey, man, for your stomach, you, you may have to do this. But the point is, is that Timothy had seen alcohol is not good for church leaders and had to be told otherwise.
So generally speaking, fill this in, generally speaking, alcohol and leadership don't mix very well. It, it's, in general speaking, it's a good thing to recognize that this is an issue. Now, some people might say, well, I, you know, I wouldn't mind being a leader in the church. I kind of feel like God's led me to some of that, but, oh man, what you're saying about alcohol, well, I, I guess I don't want to have anything to do with that. Well, well, here is a huge question that I ask people all the time. How important is alcohol to you? Is alcohol really that important to you? Let me tell you, let me tell you it's a no-brainer for me. I so love the church. I so love God's reputation. I so love his glory that it's really not that important to me. And if it was going to cause somebody to struggle, it's not a big deal to me. No problem. Um, even if I'm not prone toward alcohol addiction. Um, so it's just when it comes to leadership, you especially have to watch that. I think, but it's not just leadership. It's a principle in general that each Christian needs to carefully deal with. Our church covenant says that we simply prayerfully ask in light of America and all of the trouble that we have in a, with alcohol that you would prayerfully consider a position of abstinence. And even after you do that, if you do not feel led to completely abstain from alcohol, we make very clear that the Bible in every way condemns drunkenness at every turn. Drunkenness is completely and totally unacceptable for the Christian, ever. There is never a night, there is never a circumstance where drunkenness is ever okay for the Christian following Christ. Um, some people say, well, you know, blow it out every now and then, or this, or whatever, and you look at all the statistics, and there's, there's many, many people who feel like, well, you know, drunkenness is okay under certain, certain circumstances or in the privacy of my home, and we would say that is completely contrary to the Scripture. And so, in light of that, we need to recognize that in the life of the church for its leadership, this is a serious issue. Very quickly, number four. A pastor is not to be violent. Can you say, thank you, Lord, for that? Um, he's not to be violent. Literally, the word here is a striker, <laughs> someone who hits people, um, or a brawler. How about this? A contentious person. A pastor is not to be a contentious person. Um, you know, and you may want to make a note out here to the side, it is possible to be violent without actually hitting someone. Your words can be violent. You can be violently aggressive, even with your words. And so it's not merely that he didn't hit me, it's that he does not seek to injure, he does not seek to harm um, those that are around him, either by his hands or by his words. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 25. In verse 24 it says, And the Lord's servant must not be, circle it, quarrelsome. He must not be quarrelsome. That means somebody who likes to quarrel. But kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. You see, that's when you're tempted to strike, is when evil is done to you. Somebody says something about your wife. Somebody says something about you. Somebody says something about your kids. Somebody says something about something. You know, you're, you're tempted to, to respond. Somebody says something about whatever. Even when patiently enduring, that you patiently endure, you look at verse 25, correcting his opponents with what? With gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So um, the picture is that he's not to be violent. And finally, this is another major one. Number five, a pastor is not to be greedy for gain. Greedy for gain. Um, you could just end it with greedy, but when you talk about greedy for gain, um, part of the picture is here, he, he simply is not going to be driven to have more and more and more and more and to do anything to, it takes to get it. You see, literally, this is shameful or dirty profit. Now, unfortunately, we are all well acquainted with various individuals that have led churches that one of their big issues had something to do with money. 
that it was by seeking to have more um, through various issues. I can tell you that the pastor that started yelling at me on the phone um, had also got into business dealings in their town, in their area, where he started buying lots of property, and he, he kind of was a part of all of this. And then, of course, the crash comes. And uh, as the crash came, his reputation went down, his health went down, his, his whole picture as a pastor went down, and it had to do with seeking to run up and to have greedy gain. Um, you see, vocational teaching pastors, 1 Timothy chapter 5 says, they should be paid. So uh, it's just that money is not to be a motivation. Um, you would like to think that your pastor is motivated by the call of Christ in the kingdom of God, not by his wallet. Um, and that is, that is critically important. That's why it's listed in this list. Now, in closing, I want you to see this passage in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 20, and then verse 24. Our Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to the disciples, and he says to them, do not lay up for yourselves treasures where? On earth. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, this is so crucial for any Christian, but this is so crucial for pastors. You see, if his treasure is in his bank account, or if his treasure is in his property, or his treasure is in his retirement, and he thinks everything through that, instead of through the lens of, what is the church? What is happening with the church? How is the church? What is going on with it? Where is the church going? His motivations cannot be properly guided and mixed together. Look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Underline it. You cannot serve God and money. Now, a pastor has to understand that. And money cannot be the motivating factor in a pastor's life or a distraction. But by the way, this goes for everyone. You say, yeah, go get him. Tell the preacher. He better not be motivated by money. Well, you, you're not to be motivated by money either. In fact, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He was speaking to anyone who's following him. This is part of his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. For Christians, you cannot be motivated by money, whether you're a pastor or not. You cannot serve both God and money. I think that there are three repeating themes. There's many repeating themes in the Bible, but three that are pertinent to this today for us. The first one is accountability. We are stewards, and pastors are stewards. They are accountable. And they're not just accountable to the church body and to their accountability partners and to others. Most importantly, they are accountable to who? To God. And so are people. The Lord Jesus over and over and over again through parables and through stories and straight up teaching, Jesus warns that your life is going to give an account. We are called as children of God to live life as though we are going to give an account. Now, the great accounting is whether or not Jesus is your Savior and whether or not your sins are paid for. But there is also a picture of accounting of what have we done as God's children in being responsible for what he has given to us. Think about the talents. Think about the rich man and his rulership. Think about all of the different times when Jesus gave this idea. We are going to give an account. A pastor needs to keep that in mind. Not only is there accountability, but thankfully, 
by God's grace, there is also reward. Our God is a God who offers reward. Right out there to the side, Hebrews 11.6b. Put a little B next to it so you are reminded about what it's, uh, the emphasis that I'm making. Hebrews 11.6 says, For the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. The Lord always rewards. He never misses a payday. He knows what's going on. And the reward that he's giving, the Bible tells us that he is coming and his reward is in his hand. He's not going to come and say, okay, you did a good job. I'll have a check cut to you next week. That's not what is going to happen when we stand before the Lord. He is coming and his reward is with him. Aren't you thankful for that? If it wasn't for his grace, I couldn't be a pastor. And if it wasn't for the fact that he has promised a reward, my heart would probably lose strength. But he has promised a reward that we are called to live by. So we're going to be accountable. We're going to be held account. But he also is coming, and he's coming with a reward. Now, look at the passage there at the bottom and be reminded of what Jesus is talking about. Don't lay up yourselves treasures on earth. Um, don't serve, don't try to serve two masters. You're going to love one or you're going to despise the other or you're going to love the other one and, and hate the one. You cannot serve God and money. Here's the question. Which kingdom do you love? As a church member, you need to ask that question of yourself. Which kingdom am I living for? Which kingdom do I love? The kingdom that I'm in now that's very flawed, or am I loving the kingdom that is to come? You see, God's kingdom is the kingdom that is coming. In fact, we were told by the Lord Jesus himself when the disciples said, how should we pray? He said, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom is coming. And we're even told to pray that the kingdom will come. Jesus knew by telling us to pray like that, that we will be reminded that there is another kingdom and that we should not invest in this kingdom more than we invest in his kingdom. In fact, we are to lay up treasures there. If a man does not understand that, he should not be a pastor. He should understand that this world is not our home. He should understand that this kingdom is not for which we are living. And church members would do well to say, Lord, we are living for your kingdom and not our own. Amen? Would you stand with me for prayer?